and we'll let folks roll in. We'll see who's able to join here. Um, oh, looks like we got a few folks coming in. Well, all right. It's always fun the first few seconds as folks come in from the waiting room um, to see who is making it in. And we like to give it just a few minutes um, for seconds. Wow, we actually, yeah, we're rolling up where the ticker is going up and up. So it looks like we, we have a few folks coming and joining us here. Nice, cool. The experiment is working. Um, all right, I think I'm gonna go ahead and kick things off here. Um, thank you everyone um, for joining us here. This is the very last panel save the best for last, um, of uh, the Creative Industries Week, um, which if folks haven't joined us all week, has been a series of online discussions with creatives, artists, leaders, thinkers from all over New Mexico and beyond to basically celebrate and workshop and figure out um, the best way forward for the new creative industries division, which is a new division of the state economic development department designed to support people making a living in the creative economy. Um, and being able to make a living as an individual creative in the creative economy is, especially in 2024, arguably pretty intertwined with shared community prosperity, and especially in a state like New Mexico, where one in nine people make at least part of their living in the creative economy. Um, and it, there have been histories and legacies of tight knit um, interwoven communities for a long, long time. Um, there's cultures of things around shared resources through acequias um, and more. And so I think that it's pretty safe to say any solutions for individual creatives also have to be solutions for communities of creatives. And that's why we are very excited to be joined for this discussion of community-based economic development solutions for shared prosperity. We're very excited to be joined by Angela Merkert, um, the executive director of the Alliance for Local Economic Prosperity. She'll tell you a little bit about what that is and what that does. And Kayvon Kalitbari, who is the owner of Ramel Family Farms and is a rural creative entrepreneur and investor up in Raton. Um, so we are very happy to be joined by both of them today. Um, and they're going to tell us a little bit about what they do, their thoughts, and we're going to, yeah, just have a discussion. As always, if you've been joining us this week, please put um, questions in the Q and A, we'll, we're gonna launch a short poll um, for folks to sort of fill out at their convenience as they're listening. Um, and we, yeah, just thank you so much for joining us on a Saturday afternoon. I really looking forward, both these folks are very smart and I'm really looking forward to, to hearing what they have to say. So let's start out with Angela. So tell us Angela, first off again, thank you so much for joining us here in a hot Saturday afternoon. Um, tell us a little bit about the Alliance for Local Economic Prosperity, what it is, what it's trying to do, and, you know, how it can sort of help creative economic development and how folks can get involved. Okay, thank you, Mike, and thank you for the invitation, uh, the opportunity to join this first conference of the Creative Industries Division. Um, I really appreciate the recognition that the and this that this group is getting with the significance of the role it plays here in this state. Um, the Alliance for Local Economic Prosperity, or AFLEP as we're known, is a statewide nonpartisan um, uh, organization and a, a nonprofit that's been advocating for local economic prosperity over the last. Uh, more than five years. And we've been focused on um, especially small business development and community development outside the I-25 corridor. So we're talking about rural areas and tribal and Pueblo lands and um, 
including farmers and ranchers also with some focus on um, food processing, food distribution locally rather than exporting our food foodstuffs and, and then importing, you know, over 90% back into the state. Um, we are, um, we were concerned about how can we make an impact in uh, supporting more focus on local prosperity. And one thing that we identified was the minimal financial capacity in the state to fund actual support of that kind of community development. And um, through the research that we did, we identified the addition of what we call the tool of a state public bank into the state's financial system would be a big plus uh, to um, with focused lending programs into small businesses and into these targeted areas that we saw that um, increased access, equitable access to capital would be um, a great enhancer and make a difference here. And it would, um, we were looking for innovative, creative ideas, as you were, you used the word earlier, radical. Well, some people think that this is radical, though, um, even though there's only one state bank currently in the country, and that's Bank of North Dakota that is over 100 years old, the, this type of bank is well known and very popular in, uh, especially in Europe. Um, and it's become more popular here. There are over 30 um, initiatives going on in the U.S. right now in, in various stages of initiating a public bank, either state, local, or regional banks, uh, especially since the Great Recession. Um, it's due uh, particularly to um, the increased, or I should say, decreased investment by Wall Street banks as well as community banks in local communities. Even if they have a presence, they're not necessarily investing and, uh, excuse me, making loans available, especially in smaller amounts that uh, some of our groups, not all of them, but some of the creative industries are looking for. They're not for instance, they see the cost of um, making a million dollar loan as a whole lot more efficient, if you will, than uh, dealing with ten hundred thousand dollar loans or even more of the smaller loans. So that's a piece of the reality of current day banking that we're dealing with now. What we want to what we're focused on is how can we invest New Mexico revenues, the income from taxes and fees, and turn that around, keep it in the state and keep it flowing like the water flows through the acequias. Well, let's keep that water flowing here in the state and invest it in New Mexicans and not be sending it to Wall Street where they are investing in international projects or projects outside the state. They're making some investments in the state, but we we believe that more could be done here with our own funding if we would focus and be intentional about doing that. The other factor that I would identify is that our community banks um, and credit unions and CDFIs would be partners in this effort if we would create the state bank, it would not be a retail bank where we'd have savings accounts and checking accounts. The state would be the depositor and uh, along with the other Wall Street banks. And, uh, and I would just point out that the state has deposits of anywhere from two to $9 billion in, in deposited in various Wall Street banks on any given day. So if we're talking about starting with a deposit of 65 million, that's that's not that much compared to 9 billion uh, sitting in the Wall Street banks, but it would allow doing partner lending through the community banks and credit unions 
that would help them um, get out of what I call the black box that they work with that sets up the formulas that they use for their lending programs. And it would allow some additional flexibility in those programs. Those are restricted in part by regulations, but it's also about they are private you know, corporations and they are wanting to maximize profits for their um, st stockholders. So what we're doing is enhancing what's available for them and um, allowing them to take more risk and but not doing subprime loans. We're talking about just doing non-traditional loans, but that are still smartly made and then um, open up cap capital access for more people to really get engaged in being creative and being entrepreneurs and really um, engaging in our economies. And all of that, as you said earlier, is going to contribute to the, not only the growth of individual wealth, it's going to contribute to community wealth. And it's going to keep our help to keep our communities, whether we're talking urban or rural, uh, help them be stronger and thrive. Small businesses are, you know, um, we have more small businesses in the state than we do large and mid-sized businesses. They really are the backbone of our economy, in our opinion. Yeah, absolutely. I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I was, no, that's okay. I I can stop there, and we can come back later with for more elaboration if you like. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, I'm I'm really happy that, um, you're that you shared that. It, definitely, small businesses. I think in our research, the number is something like eighty percent. It might be higher. Um, that's off the top of my head. Um, and I really appreciate also how you said keeping the money flowing, um, like sort of the water and the acequias, you know, because I think that one of the things as we talk about these sort of innovative ways for capital to reach small businesses, to reach creatives in New Mexico, one of the things that we have to think about is storytelling, right? Like how do we tell the story of these mechanisms so they don't feel, and they're really important, and we don't want them to feel obscure to the general public. And that, in some ways, the duty of that falls on creatives and artists, right? To figure out what are these things? What do, what do we mean when we say innovative ways of accessing capital and how can we tell those stories so everybody understands them? And I think that's like a really interesting and cool potential way for artists and creatives to collaborate with folks like um, you know, the Alliance to think about how to get that out there, right? And make the story, you know, accessible because it's it's an and, important idea. Yeah. And I would um, strongly emphasize that we are members of the New Mexico Food and Agriculture Council. And we've done a lot of advocacy for farmers and ranchers and food programs through that group as well as the uh, civic policy table that has, is made up of more than 40 organizations statewide and, um, and the Southern New Mexico Green Chamber and also um, uh, Seed New Mexico, which is Sustainable Equitable Economic Democracy, ad an advocacy group for small business. So nice. over the these last several years, we've been collecting stories and, and that's an invitation I'll put out to the group today that legislators and state leaders are paying attention to that. We've been advocating for small business and talking about the lack of support in rural areas for the last four and a half years. And we feel like we have contributed to the voices that have been raised, um, especially in economic development uh, and helping get more attention placed on small business support. So right. that's, yeah. that's where we're focused and that's where we really want to continue working. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's great to to um, have a a way to collect those stories. And speaking of small businesses and stories, 
Um, we're yeah. also joined with an entrepreneur, a creative entrepreneur, um, an investor, um, and someone who has a really interesting history of, of working, implementing solutions um, in communities, trying new things and really working toward um, shared, yeah, community prosperity. Um, we've got Kayvon Kalipari here from Raton. Um, we met when I was in Raton and after our discussion um, was sort of a large group of people, artists and creatives, um, Kayvon uh, came up to me and said, um, you know, we should talk about um, community based ownership models because I have a lot of ideas about that. And I was like, oh, that sounds cool. And so then we did and they were really interesting ideas. Um, and so we, yeah, thought about it some more and invited Kayvon to talk here about some of those ideas and tell us a little bit um, about sort of why, how he came to Raton and, and what he's doing in Raton. So thank you so much, Kayvon, for joining us here from Raton. Um, certainly one of my favorite towns in New Mexico. I love all towns in New Mexico equally, if anyone is listening. Um, but I but I especially love Raton. And so thank you so much, Kayvon, for joining us. Tell tell us a little bit about, yeah, how you came to Raton and some of your ideas for the for the future. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. And uh yeah, thanks for the opportunity to talk here. You can hear me okay. I know we're having Yeah, you're a little echoey, but you're good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this vast vacant room. Nice. Um, so Without going too far back, um, I grew up in a family that was kind of riddled by my dad's gambling addiction, um, put us in bankruptcy a couple of times, raised by a single mother, uh, ended up living on my own, starting to when I was 16, uh, graduated high school when I was 16, college when I was, when I was 19. And all that went through my head during any of that was, um, how can I you know, put myself in a financial position that doesn't allow this family that I might have someday um, kind of fall, um, you know, because of the same issues that I think um, our family dealt with. So, you know, I, I had not gone to school for business or entrepreneurship. Um, I went to school for electrical engineering and ended up getting a job <clears throat> there at a high school. Um, that was back in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I moved to Denver um, about a week after my 21st birthday, the company I got a job with transferred me out there. And in that company, I found a few people that I started uh, what ended up being my first business in Denver, which was a pizzeria. And, you know, never made a pizza in that kind of setting, never ran a business. Um, so again, self-taught and just kept um, chugging and chugging and chugging, learning as I went, making a lot of mistakes. Um, those learning lessons and mistakes um, got me to, you know, being one of the first cannabis business owners in Colorado, um, still have uh, ownership in about 15 different states in the country, um, comedy production and arts magazine. Um, I ended up getting into a lot of civic engagement, especially around housing and homelessness, drug policy um, from some of my own experiences, but also uh, seeing how that um, had impacted and intersected with a lot of these other issues that I was starting to work on. And uh, all of this kind of culminated in 2019 when I ran for mayor of Denver um, and advocated for a lot of, I think, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily like the word progressive. I like, <laughs> I, I try to think of them as more rational uh, because I think you could, you could sit on either side of the political aisle and really find a lot of reason um, in the things that I was proposing. Um, they made you know, social sense in, in benefiting people and valuing in their time and valuing them as humans. Um, but they also made a lot of fiscal sense um, from you know, talking about uh, how our city, state, and federal governments operate and how counterproductive they are with a lot of our tax dollars. Um, and I, one of the things I actually advocated for was a public bank. Um, for Denver at the time. And um, I ended up uh, doing really well uh, for the, the first two campaign finance periods. I was out raising our two uh, twice incumbent uh, mayor who eventually won a third term. And I dropped out because I adopted two young girls and I still co-parent co them with a 92 year old woman. Um, <clears throat> but it was at this time that I had left the cannabis industry after about a decade. Um, this consulting firm that was wildly successful. I, 
you know, got out of politics. I got out of a long-term relationship and I adopted these two young girls and I had absolutely no idea what was next for me. And the pandemic hit and I ended up uh, driving all around uh, New Mexico, West Texas, Arizona, Colorado, looking for a small town um, that I could kind of establish some roots in. And small town because I grew up in a lot of those in Nebraska and just felt I needed, I think, something to, I don't know, take me out of Denver, which was growing too quickly and it had gotten um, so unaffordable. Um, it had become so consolidated in kind of the land ownership and um, the business entities. You know, it wasn't just a restaurant. It was a restaurant group that owned 15 restaurants and um, it just wasn't for me anymore. I ended up going down to Trinidad, Colorado, which is about 25 minutes north of Raton, uh, because one of my employees had become the economic development coordinator in town. And he invited me down to take a look. Um, I did, and I think within 24 hours of being down there, I, I put an offer in on this church that I kind of fell in love with. And I wanted to just work on that church, take my daughters down there, give them a small town experience. And um, every time I went down there afterwards to work on it, I started to, you know, meet people like myself, younger folks that were looking for a change, especially during the pandemic. Um, I fell in love with another building that was falling apart that would, you know, if, if we hadn't saved them, it would have fallen into disrepair and uh, just got to really, I don't know, fall into this opportunity. I don't know that I could describe an intention um, with uh, the work that I did down there. It just kind of happened because it felt right. And ended up renovating about half a dozen buildings there, uh, recruited a bunch of young people from all over the country to come open businesses. These businesses that we opened were based on asking people in town um, what they felt was missing in town. It wasn't like so many people do when they go into these small towns, they put in what they've wanted to do their whole life and finally found the opportunity to do. Um, I took the top 10 things that people said they wanted and I probably asked 2000 people in my first year there. And those are the businesses we recruited. Those are the, the things that we tried to offer in town. And then it's worked really well, but ultimately I soured on Trinidad, uh, mainly because of their politics. Um, it, uh, is, it's, a, it's a town that does not want to let go of its history, which a lot of small towns don't. Um, but if the only way you think you're going to get back to relevancy um, is you know, by bringing back mining or something like that, um, it's, it's just not going to happen. And you can think that way and still not get in other people's way, but Trinidad and their local government proved to be incredibly um, um, difficult to work with, difficult to discuss with about new ideas that I've seen work elsewhere. So, you know, for me to do all that I've done, not just in Denver, but all over the country and working in a lot of small communities all over the country, I tried to take a lot of these experiences around, again, housing and homelessness and small business development um, to there, and they just did not want to participate in it. Um, but in parallel, I had chatted with Jessica Barfield, um, who was living in Raton at the time. Um, she was serving in like the economic development coordinator role as well um, about uh, opportunity south of the border. And she gave me the grand tour of, you know, this area doing a lot of similar things as Trinidad's doing, trying to embrace the recreational economy, uh, trying to bring people off the interstate, um, trying to deal with vacant buildings, um, dilapidated buildings. Uh, but they seem to be going, um, approaching it in a much more aggressive way. Um, I, I say that positively. You know, I, I had no idea what a LIDA agreement was when I came down here. Um, I had always applied for grants in Colorado and felt that the competition um, was, you know, incredibly too much. You come down here and it seems like there's endless amounts of grants available um, for a myriad of purposes, um, especially around manufacturing and the arts and, you know, kind of community revitalization and things like that. Um, so uh, when I came down here, I put an offer on the old historic, historic theater down here and I got that. And it was when I did that, again, that wanting to be my, sol my solo project down here, um, learned about Lita and found out that the city was trying to give away their old recycling facility. It's, it's about nine acres, uh, 55,000 square foot warehouse on it, um, had fallen into just absolute disrepair and found out that they were quote unquote giving it away in return for economic development, job creation, um, increasing the tax base. Uh, here locally and uh, asked Jessica to make an introduction. So I met with the city and I was really impressed with how 
um, flexible the LIDA agreement was, you know, and that we could say, this is how many jobs we think we can create. Um, this is what we think we can do to bring value to the company that can be measured. Um, and we, we came to terms and we're about three years into that right now. Uh, that's where our farm is located. And in about two years, we're going to have the opportunity to purchase this building, less the cost of all the capital improvements we've made to the building, less the wages we've paid, less the, the, the tax basis increase that we've created. And um, once going one step further, after we got these, this LIDA approved, we found out about a capital outlay um, that the city had from state dollars that they hadn't used in two years for a, a new steel structure and had asked them why nobody applied for it. They said, this is just Raton. Like, you know, you got the kind of the same old people working here and they, they I don't think understand grant process. They don't, um, you know, they're, they're kind of just stuck. Good people, people running good businesses. It's not the same about, but they're very tunnel um, in how they think. So looking at these new opportunities just wasn't something that um, I think was really, um, that nobody here really wanted to pursue. So we ended up uh, thinking about how it could support this farm that we wanted to open on this LIDA agreement property and asked if it could be used for a greenhouse. And they said, yes. Um, so we built a 6,000 square foot greenhouse on there to supplement uh, the stuff that we were doing on the other aspects of the farm. Um, we also opened up a small grocery store uh, here that we call the heirloom shop. And I'll run some pictures through later if that's okay. Um, but Again, going back to asking people what they wanted in this town, we did the same thing down here. They wanted an active functioning movie theater that had other uh, forms of live entertainment. Um, they wanted fresh food. Um, there's, I think a lot of people growing fresh food here, but there's not a lot of places to access it. Um, so we invited a nonprofit called Ogallala Commons um, to warehouse in our space. And they are now acting as a food hub out of our um, warehouse where they're aggregating fresh food from all the farms, ranchers, artisans, and chefs in northern New Mexico and southern Colorado, bringing that food into our facility and then using that as a distribution point to schools and senior centers and rural markets. So we're all the way down into SIDS and Taos, um, all the way up to Pueblo Senior Resource Development Cora, uh, Corporation in Pueblo, and then pretty much every school district, senior center, and rural market uh, in between there. Um, so just really happy to, um, you know, be doing the things that I'm doing here in this small town, because you could, you could be a loud big player in a place like Denver and not get noticed for these amazing things and not get the traction. Um, but it's a really exciting idea to come down to a place like Raton where you could drop a pin and people notice um, to be doing things like this and to see what kind of attraction you can get. Um, and then really, really quickly to finish, um, I chair the board of the Center for Community Wealth Building, which is all about um, worker co-ops and employee-owned businesses and engaging anchor institutions like hospitals, municipalities, school systems, things like that, to um, guarantee that at least half of their procurement dollars um, for valet services, janitorial, food, things like that, that they usually hire out for to go to shared ownership, shared economy um, businesses. Uh, and then the housing part that, it, that really led me into the land trust conversation that we started to have um, was based on a, a, a current business partner of mine that does housing development in Denver. And he was able to build um, 92 units. He's now done four of these. Um, sell them for half of market in Denver. So we're talking three bedrooms for 200,000, two bedrooms for 179 and uh, studios for 149. Um, build them, uh, give the land, a million dollar piece of land to community land trust to manage deed restrictions for 198 years to keep them aff affordable and sell these units for half of market in Denver. And he continues to do it over and over and over and make money. So the idea that I brought to you that I'd still like to, to pursue maybe down in here in Raton is can I aggregate enough money from other individuals to buy up a town like Raton? I'll go into the issues I have with Raton, but a lot of them are absentee vacant building owners. And if we can buy all of these, put them in a land trust and deed restrict them to keep them affordable for the things that we wanna see in this town, um, I think we can do something really special and unique and something that I'm not aware of that's been done um, anywhere in the country with making sure these spaces stay affordable and in existence in perpetuity for creative businesses, retail businesses, 
manufacturing, um, all the things that I think we need to see in this small town to, to have a localist mindset on how this economy and the city grows. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Kayvon. I'm, I, um, I'm really happy that you told the whole story and shared the whole context there um, because, yeah, the the core of that right like um, well not the core but like where you ended on the community land trust I think is such an innovative and exciting idea and um, so such a cool prospect and especially like you said for creative businesses to stay in perpetuity for that purpose and to have like community investment in that idea and in the property itself I think is it could be something very exciting for the creative industries in New Mexico. Um, and I also think, yeah, it's really important to see that in the context of the whole story. I am curious, um, and we got a, a, a couple, we got a, a, a question in the chat about this. Um, I feel like we answered the, how that came back to the subject at hand. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark that. Thank you to the anonymous attendee who was grumbling about when we were going to start talking about um, the topic, but we we are, um, yeah, the community land trust is the topic. And I definitely want to ask both of you, um, like you mentioned, Kayvon, your experience in Trinidad, and you said people sort of clung to their history, right? And, and you were talk referring specifically to mining. Um, and I would say that like, if you were to go pretty much anywhere in New Mexico and say that, like that might cause some feelings, right? Because like New Mexico has like a very, very rich history and a very important history and a history that goes back way before even New Mexico was New Mexico, right? All the communities um, that have been here for thousands of years. And so I want to come back to that, but I want to ask in a general way, both of you, and, and maybe we'll start with Angela, like with this idea, right? You've hit on this idea. So we, we're really talking about, there's two big ideas so far. There's the public bank and the community land trust. Let me ask you, zooming out, how are how can these ideas be part of the culture of the communities that are already in New Mexico, right? Um, because sometimes ideas seem to float out from the ether um, and don't seem, uh, anchored to or integrated with culture. Um, but I feel like both of you have thought about how these ideas are part of the culture in New Mexico and the heritage of New Mexico. And so maybe Angela, we can start with the idea of how does a public bank tie to some of the cultural heritage of New Mexico? Does that make sense as a question? It does, and it's a great question. Um, and it's something that we're engaging with right now. We have what we're calling um, a bit of a, um, well, it's a North Central region project um, in a five county area um, of New Mexico that it does include Colfax County. And um, and we are looking at um, what we're going to, what we're beginning to do is have community conversations in those five counties and talk about looking ahead at the possibilities for those communities because they're all feeling the strains, Las Vegas, Mora, um, Raton, others, uh, Española, all feeling the stretches and strains of uh, losing population, losing businesses, um, and feeling um, feeling different kinds of ang both anxiety, angst, um, and desires for having something different. And to Kayvon's point, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily wide open for change right now, but we're engaging in conversations and saying, what are the possibilities you see? What would you like to see in your community? What do you want? What do you see as the gaps here that um, would, that, what are the, what's the potential for this to be a thriving community? And they they have great ideas and it's not all about just in businesses, but businesses, especially grocery stores where they can get fresh food, um, 
is a big one. And uh, pharmacy where they don't have to drive 50 miles to go to get their prescriptions or depend upon the mail, um, those kinds of things. But it's about what are the potentials for small business development behind that? What can be helped with that? So then looking at, okay, then what are the possibilities? Where and how do you put the capital together to show how to make that happen? The other the other factors that we're dealing with, uh, especially related to uh, farming, are how to adapt to the cult to the climate disruption that's going on, and so what what is the assistance that will help them adapt new pro practices, um, which in many cases are more of the indigenous oriented practices that we've had for centuries. But with loans that we could develop through the public bank, we can address those. There's federal money available that gets left on the desk every year because farmers often need that 10% to match against the 90% of the federal money. And they'd be able to get, engage in some of those adaptive practices. Um, we could do that. They don't want to put up their land as collateral, which makes full sense, no farmer does. But through the kind of lending programs that we could develop out of the banks, we can expand that. And we can also help to support the kind of collectives that Kayvon is talking about the and the cooperatives that uh, small farmers can gather together and create those larger, um, more more efficient uh, distribution groups and yeah. processing groups. So there are a number of ways that the by the initiation of both the conversations we're initiating and out of those conversations backing out, okay, what are the implications for the lending programs that we can put in place that will support what what the desires are here? And right. then how do we recruit the people to come into those jobs and to into those businesses? Right. And um, but look with the bigger picture instead of more fragmented. That and that's one of the challenges that the legislature is beginning to look at more closely too, with through the like the NMFA projects in infrastructure. There's tended to be this sense of having a one-off. You know, we'll work on the water system, or we'll work on um, roads, or we'll <clears throat> work on this bridge. But what's the bigger picture for a community in terms of both its infrastructure support, as well as, and that's education and medical services too, and air and water quality, right. those kinds of needs. Yeah, but how do those all fit together in support of what a thriving community can be? So if we had a bigger picture look, it wouldn't all be addressed through the public bank. But we intend these conversations to help to develop a, a bigger picture look and and then identify the resources that can can point toward uh, development of those different areas. But it's about getting out of looking at things as they used to be, rather what's possible next? How do right. we look ahead and how do we develop a structure that will support making a por at least a portion of that possible, make it help to make it happen? Absolutely. Yeah. And the way, and you know, you mentioned collectives of farmers and also I would say collectives of artists, right? And collectives oh, of absolutely. creatives. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. And the I know that like and I, I maybe maybe I don't have to make this explicit or it's pedantic or something, but um, I can imagine someone sort of hearing this and and thinking like, what does this have to do with artists and creatives? But in my mind, all of these solutions are themselves um, a like very creative and innovative solutions, and like you're pointing out, Angela, are also sort of connected to um, heritage cultural values, like the things that you're saying remind me of a conversation um, on Thursday with Kathy Sanchez um, from Tewa Women United. And she was talking about the same things like 
holistic community health, the fact that you can't actually separate all these things from each other. Um, and she was talking about um, sort of innovative credit models um, with sort of collective credit. And, and she herself is also an artist, right? And like artists lead these, these, these innovations, not only in making art for themselves, but as you both pointed out, in responding to what does the community want and how can we sort of dream up imaginative ways to fill those community needs? Um, and I wanna ask you, Kayvon, um, as, um, cool. I wanna ask you, Kayvon, um, and, and sort of tie into a question. So you are not from Raton, right? You came to Raton. Um, how do you feel when you um, sort of interact with, as sort of an outsider, you have these ideas, um, what, what, what do you feel like, and obviously your experience is one place, one town, um, but there is a question in the chat about sort of quote unquote resistance to change, which I don't know if, if that is really what we're talking about, but how do you feel the interaction has been with some of these ideas coming in as an outsider? Um, in in Raton, does that make sense? <clears throat> yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think most people who are here are either indifferent or supportive of new ideas. Um, I think it's easy to apply more weight to some of the few people that are opposed because they're often the loudest, and you know they're the ones that are going to go to a council meeting and complain about it. They're going to be the ones that are going to be incredibly vocal at the coffee shop in the mornings and things like that. Um, I've done my best to tune that stuff out. You know, I think you give people an opportunity to dialogue and have a conversation about it. And if they don't want to participate in that reasonable conversation, then there's not really much I can do at that point. I think to try to win everybody over is a fool's errand. Right. Um, so I try to find initiatives that to me make sense, um, but that can also be sold to, um, you know, not in a financial way, but sold to the, a, a certain segment of people in town that that are the doers, you know, and they're, they're, there are people that have lived here for generations and people that have just moved here that are on the same page about what they want Raton to be. Um, so like the mine issue, for example, sure, people will say that they want the mine back. But if you dig down a little deeper, there's probably only a handful that say they only want the mine back, you know, and that's that's going to be the key. Most people realize we have to have a more diversified economy if we're not going to go through the same boom and bust cycle that these towns have gone in for forever. If the mine wants to open, that's great. If the racetrack wants to open back up, that's great. If we want to embrace the tourists coming off the interstate, that's another one. The rec industry, uh, local manufacturing, this is getting an interstate from Amarillo, you know, let's be a transportation. Like we need to be multifaceted, I think these small towns do, um, if we're going to ever um, get beyond boom and bust, um, see that, that ticker on population, on economy go slowly up and not do this wave that it's done. Um, historically, uh, you know, the thing that I like about the community land trust it, is that depending on who the audience is, I think you can sell it in different ways. You know, everybody in this town complains about vacant buildings. Um, you know, who who owns the vacant buildings? There, there are, you know, people who have held them generationally that just don't have the money to fix them up. I get that. Um, I think there are far fewer than the speculative people who often don't live in Raton, own half of our downtown. They don't visit here. They don't try to rent these properties out. They don't fix them up. Um, I don't, there's not a political person on the political spectrum um, outside of a few unreasonable people that would you know, say that they don't want something to happen with those buildings. Um, so I, I think it's about how you frame conversations. If I came down here with the same language that I think a lot of people in Denver use, um, and went in and had these conversations, I probably wouldn't get very far. Um, but fortunately, I left Denver because I got tired of some of that stuff too. Um, you know, this, I, I don't know if I'll say it, but like ultra woke stuff, you know, where like everybody's 
uh, everybody's evil for owning a business, for example, which I got called out as in Denver when I was running for office. So you're a business owner, you're part of the problem, you know, um, because I, I, I wasn't about everything being egalitarian all the time and everybody having everything they need all the time. Um, you know, down here, that, that conversation is not going to fly. <laughs> uh, what does fly down here is that if you can take care of the things that I ran on, let's make sure people have housing, healthy food, health care, um, you know, good schools and the internet. I think if you do that for people and you stop criminalizing matters of public health, people will create their own opportunities. So what community land trusts, in my, from my perspective, what they're meant to be is to preserve, especially land and buildings, because those are the first things that go as soon as a town becomes popular. They get bought up, they get sold to the highest bidder, and all of a sudden, everything that made that town great, I've seen it in Colorado happen over and over, uh, they're gone. That's community land trusts are a way for all the people that are here now, the people that have been here generationally and the new people to come together to say, we want these in our town. We wanna to dedicate these properties to these uses in perpetuity. Um, we're all agreeing to that. We're agreeing to a price. We're agreeing to baseline incremental price increases every year to keep up with expenses. And no matter what becomes of Breton, it could become a metropolis 50 years from now that this community land trust is still gonna be serving the same purpose of providing affordable retail space, affordable manufacturing space, affordable creative spaces, affordable housing um, for those young people who are gonna be the kids of the folks that live in town now or the new people that move here 50 years from now. And so to answer your question, I just think it's about how you, I think it's about watching the words that you use and finding a common thread that everybody can get on board with and seeing if you can push them the same direction. But to expect that we're gonna get everybody on the same page, not get resistance, it's just not not reality. Right, right. We got a couple of questions. Um, sorry, go, go, go ahead, Angela. Just a quick comment that I'd like to add there. When we were talking about the creative collaborations, um, what I'm, what we're finding in our conversations as we're meeting with people is um, especially since we're in northern New Mexico, is working, we are working with the cultural um, uh, and historical background embedded in these conversations. The concept of carencia of place um, is very strong in coming through many of these conversations in this five county area. And um, a part of what the, those conversations are that I think have applications here with uh, the creative industries is um, how to enhance and um, either enhance current traditions that um, and ceremonies and celebrations that may be dwindling or how to, um, so how to enhance those or how to embrace um, even more celebration of place and how can that play out through some of the creative kinds of groups that are um, possible in these communities. But, but that's definitely coming through the conversations. And I want to note that because that's <clears throat> that has a strong honoring of place and um, the, the regional values coming through those conversations. Yeah. And my back, real quick, back to our phone conversation that we had a while ago, you know, you had asked, um, how do you make sure that these land trusts, if it was to get created, are considerate of what um, Angela just mentioned, are considerate of, you know, not just folks that have been here generationally, but, you know, getting into um, indigenous culture and things like that, which New Mexico holds in an incredibly high regard as it should, um, is, you know, you're you're creating a a group of people that are, you know, one, creating this framework, um, but two, operating in it. And I think, you, you know, it's, it's, it, it's the boring stuff. It's creating bylaws that say that certain representation has to exist, um, that certain values have to be um, upheld throughout the, the life of that, of that land trust. And if you could, if you could do that and invest, oh my, my dog, um, if you could do that and get the money from a more broad 
um, capacity, like we talked about crowdfunding it from a place like Raton, having the people that are in Raton own that land trust, right? That's more, that's better than public land. It's not a city owning it. Um, that's the people in this town owning it, Collective. passing it on to generations. And that that might be maybe an answer to um, a question here in the Q&A by Alan. Um, if a community land trust property is initiated and the co-op business fails, what happens to that property? Um, does that, and maybe that sort of feeds into what you just said, Kayvon, um, with the bylaws and, and, you know, you're basically saying like the people figure that out at the beginning, but what else would you say um, to that question? Well, you know, I, th I think one, on, on the front end, you're finding money that is patient. You're finding money that isn't looking for a return like you would normally get from, you know, going out and finding a million dollars. Somebody says, well, I want 10% every year. Well, right. <laughs> it's kind of like I mentioned a social impact bond. You know, there, there, there are a lot of uh, egalitarian investors that, you know, invest in a lot of things these days. And I've seen a lot of that money in New Mexico where they want it to succeed. They want this thing to work, whatever they're invested in. But if it doesn't, they're okay with that too. And they're, they're okay losing that money. Um, right. And I think it, it would be very difficult in a land trust model to lose that property. Like it may sit vacant like it is now, <laughs> um, but I think it would be very hard. I, I have 10 retail units in Rotom, okay? All these other people that own properties in Raton say that you can't rent it out. Nobody wants to open businesses here. It's just not working. Why are they sitting empty? Um, that's the answer they, they give. But I see it as them charging too much, them being a, a, an over-controlling landlord, a burdensome one to their tenants once they're in there. I have 10, they're all full because I charge reasonable rates. Um, I probably rent to people who a more experienced investor might not because they don't have, you know, experience as an entrepreneur themselves. Um, I give people more chances. And I think when you do that with the community land trust, you're going to have those lower rates. You're going to have more patience with people. You're going to offer those opportunities to people that wouldn't otherwise have them with a traditional landlord. And I just, I find it very hard um, to believe that any investment around controlling this much real estate um, would fail to the extent that you would have to get rid of those properties. I think at the at the, the worst case scenario is they sit empty just like they are now. Right, right. Well, that's a, yeah, that makes sense. Let me um, throw a few questions. Let me see if I can package a couple questions for you, Angela. Um, Jessica Royball asks, what are the immediate challenges to overcome to create these public banks? And are there successful precedents beyond the North Dakota bank? Um, and uh, she also is asking, Jessica Robel is asking um, about cooperative models for owner. Actually, those are pretty different questions. <laughs> I was trying to make them the same question, but they're just, they're not. So yeah, let's let's hit quickly. Um, what are the immediate challenges to overcome to create these public banks, Angela? And are there successful precedents beyond the North Dakota Bank? Uh, I'll answer that second one first. Um, and that is there are precedents, but they're not in the United States because the um, the Wall Street banks have kept them from developing. Uh, we've had five national public or four national public banks, but they all had to have sunset clauses in them um, in order for the for the legislation to pass on them, and they were all successful. Um, and there's currently an initiative underway for creating a national infrastructure bank uh, that would address the high needs of um, infrastructure funding around the country. Um, but that's the history in the United States of uh, public banks. They're very successful in Europe and have been for four and 500 years. Um, in terms of what are the challenges now, it's, um, it's about working with legislators to uh, deal with new ideas. Um, they are open as long as we have this, what I call this um, um, storm of uh, gusher of money coming in uh, with revenues from the oil and gas industry. They've been setting up more and more um, loan funds for different needs, different topics. 
the challenge of those loan funds is that they run out. You know, you you uh, allocate, you make the loans unless they've set them up to be, um, they well, they're not necessarily self-sustaining, but they don't, they're not going to necessarily grow beyond what those, you know, if it's a $100 million fund, it's just a $100 million fund. If you give me a hundred million in deposits, I can turn that into a um, hundred times ten times twelve, and turn that into lending power because a bank can create that money. And so, um, helping them get that um, understanding, and also, um, I think a piece of it is letting go some of the um, letting go some of the control. There would be um, there would be uh, a mix of community and banker or, or financial background and state officials on the board, but I um, with legislative input, it would be a state owned but not state managed, and I think that's another cringe that they have about that. But um, we've addressed a lot of the issues in the legislation, so. And we've had an increasing number of legislators support it. So um, mm. you put the web address in the I did. In I the did. chat. Yeah. And if others have questions about that or want to find out uh, more about the legislative context we've been making, you're welcome to uh, get in touch with me about that. But um, we show that it can be successful. We've done a pro forma, a, a financial business plan. We've had it audited, um, and uh, and we we see um, a strong return by the end of the first seven years, as well as getting out. You know about. Um, well, let's see. We started with sixty five, getting out about. Uh, I think it's four hundred eighty to five hundred million in loans by the end of the first seven years. Hmm. Actually, the first six years. Hmm. So interesting. That's a lot of. That puts a lot of fuel into business development. We think. Yeah, yeah, and then um, we're sort of we've hit our our hour here. Although there's there's nothing after us, so. Um, we, we're not we're not as in a as big a hurry as we sometimes are. Um, but I want to make sure to hit um Jessica Roadball also asks about resources for cooperative models of ownership. Says I'm working with an urban community land trust that is looking to provide a cooperative model for ownership. Do you know of a resource? So I'm guessing um maybe like an existing model, um a sort of repository of models, like a, a way to to sort of figure out where to start so they're not starting from blank. I'm, I'm guessing that's that's about what we're asking there. Do, do, do either of you wanna jump in and just off the top of your head, like, oh yeah, this is a good place to go for this kind of uh, community land trust cooperative ownership model. Um, well, the, the group that I sit on the board of Center for Community Wealth Building, they're a Colorado-based group, but I don't know of another organization exactly like them anywhere that's not in like Minneapolis or on the East Coast. Um, so even though this might be a New Mexico question, I think they would be a great resource. Um, if not, they would, I think, know somebody that fits in, um, that would fit that question well. Um, there's also the National um, Employee Ownership, uh, gosh dang it, they're based out of the Bay Area. Um, I'll, I'll get that to you. Um, sure. And we can send an links to people in a follow-up email as well. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really happy you asked that question, Jessica, because I think that, um, you know, people like, like I said earlier, like, you know, people in New Mexico um, are passionate about, and rightly so, about contextualizing solutions um, in ways that are meaningful to the cultures that have existed here in the native and Pueblo cultures before this was New Mexico, before colonization. Um, and I think that, um, as we look to other models, I mean, that that's 
it's just practical reality. Like you were saying earlier, Kayvon, that if these are good ideas is something for the people to decide and the way these ideas arrive is something for the people to sort of agree on here and, and maybe contextualize them um, for themselves. Um, and then you had your hand up, Angela, so I'll make sure that, that you um, get a chance to answer that question as well. Well, one of the examples that I know is the Agriculture uh, Cooperative in the South Valley of Albuquerque. And I think that they belong to a larger network too, but it is, um, it's farmer owned. Can you so say the name of that again? Agricultura. No. Agricultura. Yeah, we've um. Exactly. Yeah, I. I. Yeah, that's a that's a good example. Um, um. Let me put the link to that in the chat. And I know there's a few others, like there's sawmill. Um, sawmill is another one, and then in this um southern part of the state, the Mesilla Valley. Um, I can't remember. There's another word that goes with it. At cooperative. Um, is also a strong one, and they are doing a lot, um, especially now with the borderlands, I think, but they're uh, tied in there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, yeah. And one of the reasons I brought up Center for Community Wealth Building is they're not actually a co-op or any of that, but they right. help people become. So, you know, when you're talking about getting those questions answered about how to organize, um, how to manage those things, the processes, the paperwork, the expectations, um, that's something that they can help folks with. Awesome. That's really cool. That's good to know about. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, uh, thank you both so much for joining us and chatting and, and spending this hour. Um, yeah, I think that, um, oh, cool. Jessica is, I'm working with Sawmill to create a cooperative development. Nice. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, at some point during this discussion, um, it's probably, I mean, you know, if people are hanging out with us on at three o'clock, two to three o'clock on a hot Saturday afternoon, this is like, they're probably like very smart people. And this probably like, I don't need to say this, but like, I just think that all of these ideas are so relevant to creatives and artists, um, and to figuring out how to move, um, beyond just sort of making art for ourselves or making art as a commodity and figuring out how to organize together, how to pursue some of these solutions um, and it's messy and yeah. Um, but I think that these ideas are, are important to talk about and argue about um just as much as like whether a painting is good or not <laughs> um mm -hmm. and and so i really really appreciate um both of you taking the time to join us here um to to share some of these these ideas and and get people sort of revved up about them do you want to make have a last word there angela yeah i was gonna say i think uh what i hope is coming through is that sense of what creates, what can strengthen what we already have as community? What else is there that supports us and um, and that addresses this whole, the concept of well-being for the whole as well as the individuals and how right. do we honor who we are and where we are? But that goes into those layers of community. So I just wanted to name that. But thank you for this opportunity to share. Yeah. And thank you both. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Kayvon. Thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, and yeah, we'll send out some of these links some, um, into the follow-up email. And if folks aren't doing anything today and want to get out into the heat, um, I know that there's a lot of cool stuff happening across New Mexico today in Raton um, at the Kearney. There's a Kearney pop-up. Um, I think it's still going on. Um, in Clovis, in Española tomorrow, um, the Española Lowrider Association at the Bond House is putting on a really cool event with the San Gabriel Historic Society. Um, in Gallup, there's Gallup Arts Crawl, um, some really cool stuff happening um, at uh, 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 Art 123 Gallery and at the library out there with the Makerspace. Down in Las Cruces, there's the Doña Ana, Doña Ana County Creativity Fest um, run by 
um, Donia Anna County and organized by Irene Oliver Lewis that's happening down there. Um, what else? My, oh, there's the, of course, um, my um, friend and colleague Rashan and Vital Spaces is running a um, very cool pop-up for makers in Cathedral Park um, today and tomorrow. Um, we had a, a great a music festival in Albuquerque on Thursday, Bueno Fest. I'm sure I'm leaving stuff out, which is just what's so great about New Mexico. So there's always something going on. Please stay hydrated, stay safe in the heat, but please get out there and, and sort of revel and celebrate arts and creativity in your community. Um, so thank you guys so much for joining us and thank you everybody. Have a great weekend. Let's keep talking about this as we go. All right. Take care. Bye. Thank you.